Dear friends, the topic of my, my speech today is Europe is stronger than you think if we reinvent ourselves. And I'm very much looking forward to a good discussion after my presentation. It seems to me that we Europeans have a need to re-examine our own role in the world from time to time. Where are the roots of our relative success in the world? Why is it that our continent has been the dominating force over so many centuries? Many famous historians and philosophers have dedicated much attention to these questions. The German Arthur Spengler in the 1920s was perhaps the greatest among the many pessimists. He was convinced that the Western cultural sphere is an organism in decline and will ultimately perish. Arnold Toynbee, the great British historian, was only slightly less pessimistic. Perhaps he still gave us some hope if we get our act together. Today, similar thoughts come from many sources. But before we concentrate our minds to deploring our fate, perhaps it would be better to first ask ourselves which have been the strengths that have made it possible that Europe <coughs> as a political, economic, and cultural region has for so long had such a crucial role in the world affairs. The well-known British-born Harvard professor Neil Ferguson offers his own explanation in a recent book called Civilization. The Western world, according to him, has had some decisively important qualities. He calls them somewhat suspiciously a six killer applications. But before we go into that, let me share with you a quote from the aforementioned book. Here Ferguson quotes from 1800 century text called Rasellas, Prince of Abyssinia, and this is the quote. By what means are the Europeans thus powerful? Or why, since they can so easily visit Asia and Africa for trade or conquest, cannot the Asiatics or Africans invade their coasts, plant colonies in their ports, and give laws to their natural princes? The same wind that carries them back would bring us hither. Ferguson does not leave us with that only. He also offers an answer to his why. His philosopher called Imlac replies, because they are more powerful, sir, than we, because they are wiser, knowledge will always predominate over ignorance as man governs the other animals. But why their knowledge is more than ours? I know not what reason can be given, but the unsearchable will of the supreme being. Ferguson thinks he does know. His six killer applications are his explanation to why we have been wiser or less ignorant. The economic success is based on fierce open competition. That is the force that has spurred European economies to superior performance. The second decisive factor is science. The scientific achievements are a good explanation for many of the exploits of our culture. The third is property. By that he means that private ownership, which is guaranteed in an environment of rule of law, has been a great stimulus to prosperity. The fourth is medicine. The success of Western nations has been large possible due to the better health care. The fifth is consumption. It has much to do with the worldview that is the opposite to worship or frugality, since consumption is seen not only as an acceptable but even as the fulfillment of at least some aspects of human desire, it has become a driver. The sixth is quite flatly and simply work. The key factor is work ethic. Here he quotes Max Weber, who has coined the phrase Protestant work ethic. It is, of course, an impossible task to compress Ferguson's some 400 pages into less than a page of text, but his points are still worth making. If there are, or rather have been, the sources of our accomplishments and our perceived strengths, where are our weaknesses today? 
I will start with the weaknesses which are shared by most highly developed nations and which are very difficult, if at all possible, to amend. The first is the unfavorable demographic de development. Western societies, almost all of them, are aging societies. The birth rates are low. The great achievements of medicine and economic prosperity have extended the lifespan of Western nations. Those in working age are fewer and fewer. Immigration has been, to some degree, a palliative, but it does not come without problems of its own. Policies designed to boost birth rates have been ineffectual. Countries with long history in accepting immigrants and in observing them into mainstream have done better than those where there is no such tradition. These are indeed main challenges to the mature European economies. Inadequacy of a skilled and flexible workforce is one of the reasons why manufacturing industries more and more relocated to developing countries. There are several other reasons as well, such as increasing purchasing power in the developing parts of the world. To relocate production closer to the markets is a purely practical consideration. In many European countries, we face the problem of high unemployment, in particular among the youth and the immigrant community. As many as about half of the younger generation are in some countries without work. If this state of affairs is long-lasting, the consequences can be grave. This has led to the unrest and to crime. Irresponsible political movements have exploited these phenomena, causing thereby much ill will and unwillingness to find constructive solutions to the problems at hand. Our societies are undergoing a process of change, demographic change, economic change, and cultural change. The great question is, does our political culture find solution to these problems respecting democratic values and full observance of rule of law? In many European countries, traditional political parties have been broken up. That may be a desirable de development if they are incapable of transforming themselves in lockstep with the rest of the society. On the other hand, new parties, often led by populist inexperienced leaders, add to the unpredictability of political life. That is certainly not auspicious to economic development. The role of the political parties has changed considerably in several European countries. They no longer offer political, all-comprising, coherent doctrines, but rather solutions to various problems, often reflecting special interests within the party. Since developed, coherent ideologies have lost much of their importance. The basic political principles, such as democracy and rule of law, become even more important than before in giving a value-based foundation to political activity. One of the deeply worrying developments is the widening rift between the North and South. It is a fact that many of the Southern members of the European Union are in extremely difficult situations. Very high unemployment and even higher youth unemployment coupled with destitute immigrants cannot last for long without very serious, severe political consequences. The recipe for improving the situation has been austerity. It seems to me that further cuts in public spending are no longer politically wise nor economically helpful. The realization of this seems to gain wider support. The International Monetary Fund has already confessed that it has been guilty of misjudgment. Dear friends, I come from a country where fiscal discipline and balanced budgets have been the rule for the decades. The rule for sure, but exceptions have been accepted, if temporary. We are at present well within the limits set by the Euro Treaty for budget deficits and public debt. That is, however, nothing to brag about. We too face the very same problems of an aging population, relocation of manufacturing industries, and increasing youth unemployment. Fortunately, we have, however, been spared from violent outbursts of youth rage. Social model we have implemented, called the Scandinavian model, has so far proven to be strong and crisis-resistant. Resi Not without exceptions, but exceptions are rare. 
the potential basic problems are nevertheless not too different from those in southern Europe. Perhaps we have had more luck in dealing with these challenges than our brothers in the south. We must not drop our card by being overly confident because we have so far avoided the worst turns in our development. The Scandinavian countries are not, of course, alone with their general political and social principles. Much of the same would be true in countries such as the Netherlands and Germany, or Germany. It was, after all, Ludwig Erhard, the German Minister of Economy and later the Chancellor, who coined the expression social market economy or socialische Marktwirtschaft. It is sometimes said that an egalitarian society may be desirable as it is more just and more human, although it may not be as competitive as societies where fierce competition increases productivity and innovations. This argument does not hold water. Some American economists have claimed that the Nordic countries cannot be as innovative as those where there is no cuddly capitalism. They say that societies where the life is safe from the cradle to grave are less productive, less innovative. Figures tell the different story. Such critical indicators as patterns per, for instance, million of population show that the Nordic countries do well. In comparison with, for example, the United States, they are good competitors. Statistics from some three years ago are clear. There were 48.7 patents per American, 88.3 per Swede, 60.5 per Dane, and 63.9 per Finn. In other words, this indicator shows that innovations are not hamstrung by the social model we have in our part of Europe. The figures indicating labor productivity are almost similar. The key to all this is good mobilization of human resources by egalitarian policies, first and foremost in education. In the Nordic countries, a large share of population is employed, although the Americans put in more working hours. Equality is productive. That may sound like heresy to those who believe in a stratified society. But if the proof of a pudding is in eating it, our fare has a good taste. Since Europe is today, in economic terms, one largely amalgamated and unified region, the role of the European Union is central. It is, however, salutary to remember that the resources available to the execution of the EU policies are no more than 1% of the GDP of the member countries. Flushing money there where the problems are is therefore no more than a, a palliative. Here we come to the difficult part. If there is not enough money to solve the problems, the usual recipe is structural reforms. That is a pair of words we often hear, but not very often what is exactly meant by so saying. Most of the structural reforms are, if implemented, sour grapes. Nobody wants to hear that their work input is not really worth what is paid for, it's since there will be others in distant places who do the same equally well for much less. They do it because they have access to the same tools we have had for some centuries. Furthermore, they today live in an environment, both economic and social, where there is a fierce competition. The fruits of scientific research are today low fruits. Wherever property is reasonably well protected, where major health problems are under control, where a community based on high consumption is possible, and where the work ethic, ethic is high, there will be success. In brief, the factors that Neil Ferguson sees the explanation to the well-being of Western society, societies are no lo longer their monopoly. Globalization is a greater equalizer. It rewards those who are flexible enough to make good use of new tools. It punishes those who, whose capacity to rejuvenate themselves economically, socially, and politically is uh, insufficient. The classic theory of division of labor would have it that economic development in one country can be, and probably is, beneficial also for other countries. 
that creates new possibilities to mutually beneficial trade. Dear friends, is this true even today? It seems to me that the speed of change today does not allow the traditional industrialized countries much time for reinventing themselves, for adapting their productive machinery and their institutions to a new situation. The newcomers make use of new techniques, new processes and other innovations so fast that they are as producers on our level in no time. Where then is our comparative advantage? How do we maintain our achieved standard of living on the present level or even improve on it if in such competition? We have, I believe, certain advantages on our side not yet fully utilized. One of them is ever closer cooperation in education and scientific research. We still have the advantage of a well-educated and thoroughly trained workforce if we make use of it. Our institutions are strong. We have the advantage of relatively balanced political culture. For us, the rule of law is more than just a lofty principle. Our societies have their problems, but being open societies as they are, we do not try to wipe them under carpet. I did mention cooperation, but that I mean that the possibilities and opportunities afforded to us through the process of economic and political integration are by no means exhausted. The European Union is a work in progress. The tumultuous years we have experienced lately have made some of us convinced of the need for more integration, in particular in our economic and financial sectors. Others see their misgivings as proven. I belong to the camp who believe that economic process and social justice do not mutually exclude one another. A just society can indeed be a more productive society, but not by just extending old policies without re-examining them in the light of global competition. Resistance to the change is well ensconced. Special interests have their producers associations, their banking unions, their ag ag agricultural lobbies, as well as their trade unions. Most of them fear that their interests as institutions are endangered if the society finds new ways for organizing itself, and yet new forms we need. The present framework was constructed to a different world, to a world where fierce global competition was unknown to a world where the fruits of scientific research were in our possession and ours only, to a world where we had the benefit of well-organized law-based institutions. Now these are one-sided advantages. These one-sided advantages are part of history. The right question is, I believe, do we make full use of our strengths, such as scientific research and broadly-based education? or the advantages of a rational division of labor? Or do we understand how, how to best profit from unhampered trade? We have many caps in our systems. The European Union has not yet been able to develop a common energy policy at time when energy is becoming even more a key factor in international competition. Our markets are not yet as open as we like to profess much could be achieved if we could agree on a transatlantic free trade regime. My point is that there are plenty of unexploited possibilities and much room for improvement of our present performance. The point is that we have to reinvent ourselves. We must boost our self-confidence. Let me finish by quoting Neil Ferguson from the last chapter of his book. He discusses the strengths of the Western society, calling them a package like this, and I quote him. Yet this Western package still seems to offer human societies the best available set of economic, social and political institutions. The ones most likely to unleash the individual human creativity capable of solving the problems of 21st century world faces. Over the past half millennium, no civilization has done a better job of finding and educating geniuses that lurk in the far right hand tail of the distribution of talent in any human society. 
The big question is whether or not we are still able to recognize the superiority of that package. What makes a civilization real is not just the splendid edifices at its center, not even the smooth functioning of the institutions they house. At its core, a civilization is texts that are taught at in its schools, learned by its students, and recollected in times of tribulation. In times of economic and political crisis, it is easy to lose faith in our institutions and in our leaders. On the other hand, a crisis such as the one we are at present living with has not yet dislodged anything vital. The crisis resistance of our democratic institutions has proven itself. We share our wealth, at least some of it, with those who need a helping hand. We are prepared to reconstitute some of our institutions so that they would better meet the requirements of an ever-changing world. Simply, we are aware of the need to be more responsible and to be more innovative. But this I would like to add, we need to be more aware of the importance of social equity. Socialism has not succeeded in granting that, although high hopes had been attached to it. Naked capitalism, as practiced in too many countries these days, has not been the solution. What we need is fairness, hard work, justly rewarded, a caring society, but with full acknowledgement of the fact that we all have the primary responsibility for our own well-being. That is the way how a strong, dynamic, and harmonious society should be recreated. I thank you.